Good evening. Can you all hear me okay? Thank you all for being here tonight. I really appreciate uh, the intense interest in this topic, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, it's also great to be back. So it was two years ago that my wife and I celebrated our honeymoon here in the Philippines. And uh, we always wanted to come back, so I really thank uh, Dr. Ted for the kind introduction and, uh, and for spearheading, you know, with BioBalance, a very innovative approach that uh, I'm glad is, is taking on like wildfire, hopefully, because I think it has tremendous application uh, for overall health. So our overall health and longevity is tightly tied to our metabolic wellness. And this innovative approach is the, the, the best way that I know of to really target overall metabolic wellness. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking to you about the ketogenic diet. And uh, I'm not gonna tell you you need to do the diet, but I will tell you about some of the emerging applications that have uh, that we know of about the ketogenic diet that have recently, over the last 10 years, research in this topic has exploded. So you could go on, not just Google, I think it was the most Google diet in 2017, but if you go on PubMed and just simply look at the research, the basic science research, what, what I do, and we're moving the science into clinical application. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, how we're doing that and how that's evolving. So. I originally got interested in nutritional ketosis through my research with the Office of Navy Research, which is part of the Department of Defense. Uh, well, before I begin, I just like to, because I don't want to forget, thank our sponsors. The research that I'm showing you today could not be possible without the support from government uh, institutes like the Department of Defense. The Office of Navy Research has been funding me for a little over 10 years now uh, to study the effects of uh, ketones and also to understand environmental uh, physiology. And nutritional ketosis is a means to enhance our safety and resilience in extreme environments. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And we have a number of companies and foundations that sponsor us. Uh, also, I'd like to, as a disclaimer, uh, say that I am an inventor on several patents that are uh, held by the University of South Florida, and the, the commercialization of some of our, our patents has resulted in royalties that come back to the university and to me as an inventor. And it allows me to put those royalties back into the research that we're doing for ketosis. So the sales of our products are actually helping to further advance the science and the application of nutritional ketosis. So in every, anything that I'm talking about today as a PhD researcher is not to be taken as nutritional advice or medical advice. So I need to make that statement. Uh, a number of patents that I'm uh, disclosing. And uh, I am also a co-owner with my wife of the company Ketone Technologies, LLC. And our company is a consulting company and we also partner with uh, NASA and we partner with uh, the Department of Defense uh, on various projects, research projects. And so I'm gonna give a, a very general outline of my presentation today. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about how I got interested into studying nutritional ketosis through our work, me as a physiologist uh, working, funded by the Office of Navy Research, really studied the cellular, molecular, and physiological effects of extreme environments, and in particular, the undersea environment. And uh, ketosis is a countermeasure against oxygen toxicity seizures, which has really been the root uh, and a major focus of what I've been studying. And oxygen toxicity seizures are a limitation for our special operations divers. And also it's a limitation of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit. And the main kind of point that I wanna get across today uh, I'm very glad that Dr. Ted covered a lot of the biochemistry, so I rearranged my slides just before this talk uh, to not get too far down into the weeds, but to have maybe a 30,000 foot or a 10,000 foot view 
and to try to give a broad overview of the emerging applications of nutritional ketosis, but also implementation strategies. And that's where a lot of people get confused uh, because the ketogenic diet or nutritional ketosis, there's many different ways uh, on how to do it, how to approach it. And, uh, and we'll talk about ways to do it uh, clinically and ways to do it from the perspective of overall health and as a lifestyle. So we'll talk about how nutritional ketosis shifts your metabolic physiology from a glucose or sugar-based metabolism to a ketone and fat metabolism. Uh, I will talk, it's really important when we talk about the ketogenic diet to talk about the history of the ketogenic diet. So the history dates back uh, actually to millennia. It actually goes back to fasting, which puts you into ketosis. But really, uh, the roots of the ketogenic diet date back to 1921 at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, the first publication came out uh, on this high-fat diet as a means to control seizures in epileptic patients. And I think it's important to understand the roots of the diet. Um, and also, a lot of the confusion that surrounds the diet, for example, between diabetic ketoacidosis and nutritional ketosis. And I will have a slide that compares the two. Um, and then I'll talk about the proven applications as it stands now in 2018, uh, and also the emerging applications, uh, many of which we are focusing on in the lab right now. And I will gradually transition into talking about how nutritional ketosis targets tumor metabolism. And we know that there are, uh, the hallmarks of cancer are a certain criteria that classifies cells as uh, a tumor. Uh, there's very uh, defined, well-known criteria. And I will show you uh, information and I'll show you publications that clearly show that nutritional ketosis hits pretty much all the hallmarks of cancer instead of, for example, the drug that was mentioned by Dr. Thomas Seifert in the video, Avastin, which targets angiogenesis. Well, the ketogenic diet, especially if it's calorie restricted, is a very powerful anti-angiogenic uh, approach to managing tumors. But that's just one of the hallmarks of cancer. And I'll, I'll tell you how nutritional ketosis is really hitting all the hallmarks of cancer. Uh, and I'll also talk briefly about a new method to quantify ketosis uh, and looking at something called the glucose ketone index. So that's the ratio of your glucose to the ratio of ketones. And that it gives you a single number. And that single number is a very powerful biomarker uh, for metabolic wellness and management of a disease and also your general health. So, and I'll transition towards the end of my talk. I'll talk about the strategies that you can use to induce and sustain nutritional ketosis, and then our uh, ongoing and future projects. So uh, I really can't talk about what I do uh, unless I talk about the history of how I got into studying nutritional ketosis. And that was really fundamentally studying central nervous system oxygen toxicity seizures, which are a limitation for our special operations divers that use a closed circuit rebreather and they breathe high, high levels of oxygen. And the, a closed circuit rebreather doesn't have bubbles coming out of it like standard scuba, right? So there's a stealth component to this. When you're underwater, uh, you can see someone's coming at you if you're on land, if you can see the bubbles coming up. But our special operations divers use a closed circuit rebreather and it scrubs the CO2 out and there's no bubbles, or, but it's, they're breathing high oxygen. Uh, a danger of that is if they go down to just 50 feet of seawater, they're at risk for an oxygen toxicity seizure. So we work with the special operations community to understand uh, why these seizures occur and how to predict them. So as of now, there's no way to prevent or predict them. So oxygen toxicity seizures are also a limitation of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, so which has 14 different FDA-approved applications. Uh, the limitation of giving someone high levels of hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a seizure. So if you have a patient that has carbon monoxide poisoning, 
uh, to reverse carbon monoxide poisoning, you have to pressurize them to about 2.5 to 3 atmospheres of oxygen. But if you go any higher than that, you have the risk of causing a seizure. If you could mitigate uh, the risk of a seizure, you could potentially get that patient up to 4 or 5 atmospheres of oxygen and reverse the hypoxia or the damaging effects of carbon monoxide and save that patient's life. So that's another sort of potential application of nutritional ketosis because we're finding that it delays the latency to seizure. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and also briefly, when I, uh, I was part of a NASA, what was known as an analog mission, NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations, uh, here, and I'm actually here wearing uh, an oxygen mask, breathing 100% oxygen at about 2.5 or 2.6 atmospheres. And we, are, we lived in an undersea environment breathing hyperbaric air, and to get to the surface, uh, we need to do a decompression protocol over 18 hours. And when we start that decompression protocol, we have to breathe 100% oxygen. So. Uh, there's situations where there's a disabled submarine or situations where saturation divers need to come up as fast as possible and they are at risk for uh, hyperbaric oxygen seizures or CNS oxygen toxicity. So there are many different um, sort of applications of the science that we do in the lab. And to really understand fundamentally uh, what happens to our cells and our tissues and the mitochondria and our brain as a whole, we develop a wide range of, or we utilize a wide range of, of uh, methodologies and techniques, including global and targeted metabolomics, uh, atomic force microscopy, laser scanning confocal microscopy, uh, electrophysiology and radio telemetry, and we've adapted these techniques for use inside a hyperbaric, or what we call an environmental chamber. And here's an example of one of the chambers uh, and this particular chamber here was my postdoctoral fellowship project, where my project was to install uh, an atomic force microscope and a laser scanning confocal microscope inside this environmental chamber, which allows us to pressurize microscopes at uh, a level that could simulate a military dive or a hyperbaric environment. And this technology allows us, uh, atomic force microscopy allows us to get the scanning resolution of an electron microscope, but we can image living tissue with it. And the scanning probe can actually, uh, can actually push into the cell membrane and look at the viscoelastic properties of the membrane and detect subtle changes like membrane lipid peroxidation and the presence of different proteins in, in the membrane. And with confocal microscopy, we can optically section the neurons or any type of cell and measure with a high degree of precision the mitochondrial activity. So we can measure mitochondrial reactive oxygen species production. So this is uh, a very important thing to do if you are to understand metabolically how to optimize metabolism of cells in this environment. And uh, serendipitously, uh, we were studying a number of different cell types, and I put uh, a brain tumor cell type inside this hyperbaric chamber. And I observed that the mitochondria overproduce oxygen-free radicals, or these reactive oxygen species, when we give high-pressure oxygen. So that was a dramatic demonstration of what is known as the Warburg effect, where you have damaged mitochondria, uh, and because the mitochondria are damaged, the cells, the, the cancer cells, rely on glycolysis for energy. And uh, it was one of the observations that I made, you know, studying oxygen toxicity, we just happened to have a cancer cell line that I put in here, and that fired off my whole cancer research program. It's an observation I made back in 2008, uh, originally a little bit before that. So, so here, that's one example of, of one of the chambers that we have, and here's another chamber where we do radio telemetry in rodent models where we can measure uh, EEG activity, we can measure uh, seizures, we can measure uh, diaphragmatic EMG to get respiration, and we can measure uh, EKG to get uh, uh, the heart activity, and we can look at uh, heart rate variability, 
body temperature activity, all inside the hyperbaric chamber. And when we close the chamber, typically what we do is pressurize the five atmospheres of oxygen, which is equivalent to 132 feet of seawater. And typically, a rat rodent model will have a seizure, and humans also have a seizure within about five atmospheres, uh, within about five minutes, being exposed to five atmospheres of oxygen. So when we run an experiment, we basically do an experiment where the rats are eating a high carbohydrate diet going into the experiment, and they reliably have a seizure within five to 10 minutes. And uh, the experiments that we've done so, so far is not using the ketogenic diet, but using ketone supplementation for these particular experiments. And we will give the ketone supplements 30 minutes prior to diving the rats in this chamber, and it prolonged their resistance to seizures up to 600%. And as of, and we published that back in 2013, and as of now, uh, we do not have any anti-seizure drugs that can compare to the anti-seizure effects of nutritional ketosis achieved with ketone supplementation. So right now we're working, actually my wife is working uh, very hard on optimizing this approach, determining what type of ketone formulation has the maximum neuroprotection, the max maximum anti-seizure effects. So that's a very... Uh, intense area of research right now. So, and here's an example of some of the EEG measurements that we measure in the rat. And when they have a seizure inside the chamber, we can quickly flush the chamber. Uh, instead of 100% oxygen, we can flush it with air, and that quickly stops the seizure. So these seizures are very reliable. They happen they always happen at a certain level of oxygen, and they're very reproducible. So, and it causes a tonic-clonic seizure, a very powerful, also known as a grand mal seizure. So it's actually a very good uh, animal model uh, to investigate anti-seizure drugs and also to investigate the anti-seizure effects of nutritional ketosis. So as I mentioned, uh, the research program that got me into studying ketones was preventing understanding and also preventing CNS oxygen toxicity seizures. Oh, and I, I missed a slide. I can go back and show you an example of an oxygen toxicity seizure so you get uh, a visual representation of it. I don't think we have, uh, I don't think we have the, uh, sound here, but here's some early video uh, of the military showing the effects of oxygen toxicity seizures. It kind of starts out as twitching, and then ultimately uh, tonic-clonic seizures that would be, you know, very similar to uh, ones that would be observed in an epilepsy patient. So these are reversible. Uh, so as soon as you, could, you saw that he was wearing a mask, the medical officer that was standing over him was also under 2.5 atmospheres of, of pressure, but he was breathing air, and the mask was 100% oxygen. So they actually test the effects of um, kind of quantifying whether you'll be susceptible to oxygen toxicity seizures by doing this test in the military. They don't do it anymore, but it's a way to vet out and understand who may be susceptible to oxygen toxicity seizures. But the guy above him was not at a risk, the medical officer was not at a risk of oxygen toxicity seizures because he's breathing 20% oxygen. He's breathing air, but air under hyperbaric uh, environments. So, and just to get back to uh, oxygen toxicity seizures, so typically we prevent oxygen toxicity seizures by diving within the exposure limits of the dive tables. Uh, and they are, military personnel are trained to dive within a certain uh, duration at a certain depth. But if you are in a military operation and you're receiving fire coming down from you and bullets and the enemies up above and you can't surface, you are obligated to stay down there. For the, for the mission. And uh, so you can't always follow the exposure limits. So some of the things that have been tested, if they can't follow the exposure limits, are antioxidant compounds. So the theory behind oxygen toxicity seizures are th 
that there's an overproduction of oxygen-free radicals that disrupts normal brain energy uh, metabolism, but also brain signaling. And if we could attenuate or abolish the overproduction of free radicals in the brain from the high levels of oxygen, we could stop these seizures. Uh, this works well in a petri dish when you're measuring from brain cells in a petri dish. Antioxidants tend to work, but in animal models and in humans, loading uh, an animal or human up with antioxidants does not prevent oxygen toxicity seizures. So antioxidants have not worked very well. Uh, Anti-epileptic drugs are another option, but you don't want to give a special operations warfighter, a Navy SEAL, high doses of anti-seizure drugs before going into a mission because they have uh, pretty severe side effects and they can cause cognitive and physical impairments uh, on performance. So one thing that caught my attention was that fasting, in animal models, fasting was highly effective at delaying uh, the latency to seizures in a, a wide variety of animal models. So I asked the question, how does fasting change brain energy metabolism? So in uh, a remarkable study that was done in 1967 at Harvard Medical School, uh, and understand that prior to 1967, it was understood that the brain could only use glucose as an energy source. So in this study uh, by George Cahill and uh, his uh, uh, postdoctoral fellow, uh, Oliver Owen, they fasted subjects for 40 days in this study. So obviously it's a study that would not be approved by ethics committees nowadays, but they fasted them for 40 days, no calories for 40 days. They gave them fluids and minerals. And, uh, and what they observed, they look at the AV difference in blood flow to the brain. So they looked at uh, the levels of glucose and ketones and other metabolites going to the brain and coming away from the brain. And they found that in a fed state, uh, that the brain was essentially deriving 100% of its brain energy, of your brain energy metabolism would come from glucose. And after about, I would say, if you look at the graph here, about seven to uh, 10 days of fasting, the levels of ketones, in particular, beta-hydroxybutyrate in the blood, exceeds that of glucose. And ketones freely cross the blood-brain barrier. So when we start fasting, we mobilize fat for fuel, but the fat doesn't readily cross the blood-brain barrier to energize and preserve brain energy metabolism. So uh, as Dr. Ted showed in his slides, through beta-oxidation, we make uh, small water-soluble molecules from fat in the form of ketones, and these ketones are highly energetic, and they can largely replace glucose as a primary source of energy for your brain during fasting. And these, these ketones have remarkable uh, neuroprotective effects uh, I'll talk about. So after 40 days, our brains are really running about two-thirds of brain energy metabolism uh, is being derived from ketones. And we always have glucose available, right, because uh, we're breaking down some muscle for energy, and also a triglyceride has a glycerol backbone. So there's a glycerol, you know, in three fatty acids, and that glycerol backbone can make a glucose. So you're always producing glucose in small amounts, so it never goes all the way down. Uh, there's very powerful homeostatic mechanisms that maintain our blood glucose levels and our insulin levels, so insulin never goes to zero. Uh, in an extension of the study that would be uh, illegal today, and, and you would get in a lot of trouble, these he injected these fasting subjects with 20 IUs of insulin. And uh, 20 IUs of insulin caused a dramatic decrease in, uh, in blood glucose that would be pretty much universally fatal in most people, right? But these subjects, uh, they all survived without brain damage. And what was very interesting is that they were very lucid and they had they were asymptomatic for hypoglycemia. So they, were, they had no signs of low blood sugar at all uh, when their glucose levels were pushed down. And it was a direct example, uh, a demonstration that you are tremendously resilient against hypoglycemia if your ketone levels are elevated. And that has very practical applications 
for things like insulin shock or getting hungry in the afternoon or fasting you know, uh, for a period of time. If you're making ketones, your brain is essentially happy and, uh, and you're much more resilient against uh, hypoglycemia. So nutritional ketosis mimics fasting. So that was a demonstration of prolonged fasting. I would, I would say that was starvation for 40 days. So they were, they were being starved. Uh, a ketogenic diet has a macronutrient ratio that's, uh, and there's, ver there's various uh, ways that you can formulate a ketogenic diet, but generally speaking, uh, a modified ketogenic diet, w which is what I follow, is about 75% fat and not, not particularly high in protein typically about 15 to 20 percent protein. So that's actually less than like the standard American diet in protein. So when we follow nutritional ketosis, we are eating a diet that's high in fat, and that fat is metabolized in the liver and by our body tissues and makes ketones. Uh, and we also are more likely to mobilize fat from our adipose tissue to make ketones. So this, to to drive the liver to make ketones, you have to continuously sort of keep the liver uh, depleted in glycogen to a certain degree and also suppress the hormone insulin. Uh, you don't completely, you know, your insulin level is not zero, but you reduce insulin and that low insulin helps your body metabolize fat much more efficiently. And beta oxidation of fat in the liver makes the ketone bodies beta hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate and acetone, and we know that these ketones are a source of energy, particularly for the brain and the heart, and also for other tissues we find that the skeletal muscle can use ketones, our skin can use ketones, and pretty much every organ can use ketones, uh, except the liver in particular cannot use ketones. So the liver makes ketones, but lacks an enzyme succinyl-CoA transferase that prevents the liver. So so the liver makes ketones and it dumps the ketones into your bloodstream so your peripheral tissues and your brain, most importantly, can use the ketones for fuel. Uh, interestingly, cancer cells also lack succinyl-CoA transferase, which is the enzyme that's lacking in the liver. And that uh, prevents many, most cancer cells from being able to use ketones as an energy source because they lack a key ketolytic enzyme. And, and that's uh, an intense area of interest that our lab is studying right now. So as I mentioned, you can't really talk about the ketogenic diet and the neuroprotective anti-seizure effects uh, unless you talk about the history of the ketogenic diet, and I'm just gonna brush on it here. So a clinical bulletin was published uh, by the Mayo Clinic in 1921, and, uh, and this describes a, a very high-fat diet and this diet was 90% fat and maybe 10% protein with no carbohydrates at all, like zero carbohydrates. And the, this was observed at the time, they didn't have anti-seizure drugs. So it was really the, the only therapy for epilepsy, only effective therapy for epilepsy that they had at the time besides fasting. They observed and uh, epileptologists knew, neurologists knew that fasting could prevent seizures, but it wasn't something that could be sustained, right? The ketogenic diet mimicked the metabolic physiology of fasting because it lowered insulin and it elevated ketone levels and it prevented glucose from spiking, right? So this, this diet was observed that about two thirds of those completely drug resistant or drug refractory responded very favorably to the ketogenic diet. Uh, about 33% will have more than 90% seizure control with the ketogenic diet. So if there was a drug that did this, it would be a blockbuster drug. So as of now, there's no drug that is as powerful as the ketogenic diet, especially across a broad range of seizure types. So the ketogenic diet tends to work for pretty much every seizure type, almost every seizure type, independent of the etiology. So you could have temporal lobe epilepsy, you could have a Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, Dravet syndrome, and the ketogenic diet works. You could have a metabolic disorder like glucose transporter type 1 deficiency syndrome, which causes seizures, and the diet is remarkably effective for managing, for managing seizures in that case. And about 10 to 15% are what we call super responders. That is, they, they start the diet, 
they completely get off all their drugs, and they have rapid, total, and permanent seizure control. And then they can follow the diet for a couple months to a year or more, and then wean off of the diet and never get a seizure again. So as of now, if you stop drug therapy, you typically have a rebound effect and actually get more seizures. So the ketogenic diet is the only therapy that we know of that can actually cure seizures in a subpopulation of people who follow this therapy. So I found that to be incredibly encouraging and remarkable. And I realized when I was reading all the literature, and there is a ton of literature on the ketogenic diet, that it was a grossly underutilized approach for epilepsy. And I connected with people who had epilepsy that were going to have uh, brain surgery and part of their hippocampus removed. And it was the last thing after they tried many different drugs. And uh, they, they started the ketogenic diet, and it was remarkably effective. And that kind of convinced me back in 2008 that I need to study this for oxygen toxicity seizures. So I actually put more emphasis in it. Uh, I stumbled across uh, a movie by, uh, that starred Meryl Streep called First Do No Harm. And so Meryl Streep did a movie about the ketogenic diet. Most people don't know that. <laughs> but it's a, it's a very compelling story that documents uh, the story of Jim Abrams and his son Charlie. And his son Charlie uh, had severe epilepsy and he had tried more than 10 different anti-seizure drugs. And, uh, and the doctors that were treating Charlie, who's the son of Jim Abrams, a Hollywood producer, did not offer to him the ketogenic diet as a therapeutic approach. So uh, he, he was angry about that and he started a foundation called the Charlie Foundation. And when people ask me, you know, what's my number one resource to direct people to uh, for medical uh, needs, I direct them to the Charlie Foundation because it's a tremendous resource. It even has recipes, uh, many different recipes uh, that you'd be interested in. And also one of the books that attracted me was uh, by Dr. Eric Kossoff at uh, Johns Hopkins. And the team at Johns Hopkins has probably treated more people uh, with the ketogenic diet than any other academic or clinical institution. And now they've expanded the use of the ketogenic diet, not just for pediatric epilepsy, but for adult epilepsy and many other disorders. And they work closely with Duke University, where Eric Westman is there, and they're treating people with obesity and type 2 diabetes. So the applications are expanding. And that's the direction kind of my talk is about to go into. But before I go any further, I want to talk a little bit about ketosis, nutritional ketosis 101. Uh, as we know by now that ketones are energetic substrates from fat metabolism, uh, from fatty acid oxidation, accelerated fat oxidation. When our blood levels get above 0.5 millimolar, that is the clinical range for being in ketosis. And that typically it, is achieved after about 24 hours of fasting. So for the normal person who's really eating a lot of carbohydrates, they typically have to fast for about 20 hours to really get comfortably above that 0.5 uh, level. So nutritional ketosis, my definition, is any dietary strategy that gets your, your blood ketone levels above 0.5. And we know that's when the therapeutic effects and the brain energy enhancement effects start to happen. So ketoacidosis is a pathological condition that's very specific to type 1 diabetes. And my next slide goes more into that, so that's all I'm going to talk about for this slide. Keto adaptation, once you start the ketogenic diet, many people feel sick. And that's your brain going through, that could be called the keto flu. It's kind of like an umbrella term. Uh, and it's it's due to a number of different things going on in the body, your immune system, uh, maybe your body's releasing toxins from the fat it's metabolizing, but I think it's primarily due to the brain going through glucose withdrawal. If your brain is adapting, has adapted uh, continuously to using glucose as an energy source and you've never fasted, you've never tried a low carbohydrate diet, your brain is going to have a pr pretty severe reaction to that <laughs> and it's going to yeah, you might have headaches, you might feel lethargic. Uh, so it takes some time for your brain to have the metabolic flexibility to adapt 
from using glucose as a fuel source to using ketones as an alternative energy source when glucose availability is limited by your, by your, uh, your dietary approaches. And exogenous ketones are really a big part of what I study, and that's actually molecules that are derived from nature or synthetically produced that they can be consumed orally or intravenously, and they put the body in a state of nutritional ketosis. And they can feed your brain a source of energy uh, with ketones, and they're independent of the dietary restriction or the fasting that's typically associated with getting into ketosis. So one of the, the big questions I get, especially from medical students that I teach uh, and also at medical conferences, well, what about diabetic ketoacidosis or ketoacidosis in general versus nutritional ketosis? So uh, with diabetic ketoacidosis, that occurs in the absence of insulin. If there's no insulin, you have runaway ketogenesis and the liver will start rapidly making ketones and your body, uh, when you're in a state of nutritional ketosis and your ketone levels get really high, you have ketonuria, so you find ketones in your urine, and then the high levels of ketones will actually release a small amount of insulin, and that insulin will actually inhibit the liver's ability to make ketones. And there's a, no a couple other you know, really important uh, feedback mechanisms that really prevent your body, a normal person who doesn't have type 1 diabetes, from going into ketoacidosis. So it's really a non-issue unless you have type 1 diabetes. Uh, interestingly, people with type 1 diabetes, an effective way to manage that is actually with a low-carb ketogenic diet. And that's, that's really another area that could be controversial. Uh, I have a student, a PhD student, who's, who has type 1 diabetes, and he's doing a TEDx talk on this next month. And his TEDx talk will talk about how he managed type 1 diabetes with a ketogenic diet and a low-carb diet. So uh, I'll ask you to look out for that TED Talk, uh, and I'll probably post it you know, on my website when it's available. But most importantly, if you have diabetic ketoacidosis, your ketone levels are very, very high relative to nutritional ketosis, which is about 1 to 3 millimolar. Uh, insulin is dysregulated. When you're on nutritional ketosis, insulin stays low and is, and is very stable. Uh, glucose is low and it stays stable, which is a good thing. Your renal metabolism, generally speaking, uh, you have a mild diuretic effect. So when people start the ketogenic diet, uh, it's often very satisfying because you lose weight really fast. So if, especially if you're bloated and holding water, it has a diuretic effect. So you lose a lot of water initially. When you suppress the hormone insulin, Insulin's role is to make your body reabsorb sodium, right? So if your insulin's low, you dump a lot of sodium, and also the carbohydrates that you're storing in the form of glycogen hold water, so you're losing a lot of water from burning up some of the glycogen that your liver and your muscles hold initially. But muscle glycogen really doesn't change that much. It's mostly in, in the liver glycogen. Um, the acidosis that could occur with diabetic uh, ketoacidosis can be very severe if it's not remedied with insulin. Uh, typically, someone with a normal physiology does not have any metabolic acidosis at all. They may initially if they're a little bit dehydrated, uh, but generally speaking, it's a non-issue. Inflammation is elevated pretty remarkably in type 1 diabetics that, uh, that have ketoacidosis, whereas the normal person in nutritional ketosis their inflammatory markers go sharply down, and that's a very positive uh, thing. And pathologically speaking, uh, if you have diabetic ketoacidosis, your blood volume drops uh, because you have a, a very pronounced diuretic effect, your electrolytes are dysregulated, and it can lead to coma and death if it's not remedied. Whereas with nutritional ketosis or therapeutic ketosis, uh, the pathology, there are no major pathological considerations that need to be uh, considered. Uh, early studies show kidney stones could potentially be a problem, and this was in kids that used a very restrictive form of the ketogenic diet, but they found that potassium citrate supplementation completely prevented uh, the occurrence of kidney stones. There were no more 
uh, common than people on a normal diet if they took potassium citrate. So when it comes to applications of nutritional ketosis, we know there are many proven applications and many emerging applications. So things, you know, 10 years ago that I would have never even thought, you know, the ketogenic diet could be used for, including things like acne, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome. Uh, there's quite a lot of research now on exercise performance, especially with uh, the ketone esters. So the military organizations funded for about 10 years now the development of ketone esters in particular for warfighter performance. Uh, DARPA and Department of Defense put quite a bit of money into this and, and these are continuing studies. Uh, wound healing, longevity, cancer, which I'll talk a little bit about. And of course, uh, you know, the proven applications would be weight loss. So nutritional ketosis tends to work very effectively for weight loss because uh, it's a dietary strategy that makes calorie restriction a bit more feasible and, and easier to implement because it has this appetite suppressant effect. So the Atkins diet has been around for quite some time and is effective, and that's a higher protein ketogenic diet, not the optimal form of the ketogenic diet that, uh, that I'll be talking about. Type 2 diabetes is uh, very responsive to nutritional ketosis. And I know Verda Health uh, in the US is actually doing some remarkable things in patients with type 2 diabetes and already published a number of really compelling studies showing type 2 diabetes can be managed with nutritional ketosis. And you can get people off medication. About 87 to 90% of people that they put on a ketogenic diet can either get completely off their medication or reduce it to very small amounts of medication. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, inflammatory disorders, many applications that are proven uh, already and things that are emerging. And I won't go through all of them, but I want you to give, and it's not even a complete list. And, and all these things here were things that uh, are studies, typically multiple studies for each box uh, on PubMed that you can find. And when I started studying this 10 years ago, the only application really was pediatric epilepsy. So you could see a really an explosion of research, basic science research and clinical research. And I have a list of, of references at the end of my talk. So a lot of times as a basic scientist, what I get when I present to scientists is what is the mechanism? <laughs> so we are intensely studying this from a variety of different angles. And uh, what I can say that, and I'll put nutritional ketosis under the blanket of the ketogenic diet and different versions of the ketogenic diet and also ketone supplementation. So we know, let me see, so the red circles here are things that, uh, that we're particularly interested in now and, and we're starting to study, including the inflammatory markers. But broadly speaking, nutritional ketosis lowers blood glucose and elevates ketones. And that sets the stage for many different uh, biological and physiological effects to happen. Uh, broadly speaking, there's an elevation of beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. Acetoacetate is more strongly correlated with the anti-seizure effects. So when we develop ketone supplementation, to, for particular disorders that are seizure disorders, we, we use agents that rapidly elevate acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate, but there's a certain ratio, typically a one-to-one -one ratio uh, we think is optimal for seizure control. Uh, uh, acetone is elevated. So we know acetone is something like a uh, nail polish remover, right? We use acetone to, but acetone is actually, uh, is a byproduct of acetoacetate. So acetoacetate spontaneously decarboxylates, about 20% becomes acetone. And acetone in subnarcotic uh, levels in the body is actually very neuroprotective. And it actually, uh, it opens potassium channels and that helps to hyperpolarize the resting membrane potential of our neurons to help quiet our brain down and has, has a brain stabilizing effect. Being in a state of nutritional ketosis alters the neuropharmacology of the brain by converting more glutamate, which is an excitatory amino acid, to GABA. Uh, 
And GABA is an amino acid that's typically known as inhibitory, and it activates an enzyme called glutamic acid decarboxylase. So you have more of an excitatory neurotransmitter that could be neurotoxic being converted to an inhibitory neurotransmitter that has a brain stabilizing or calming effect. So this has been shown in a number of different studies in animal models and in humans that, that's, that use the ketogenic diet and also ketone supplementation. So we know that the ketogenic diet, nutritional ketosis, lowers glucose, it lowers insulin, it also lowers the formation of reactive oxygen species from the mitochondria. So when the mitochondria are utilizing ketones as an energy source, uh, it oxidizes Q of the semi-ubiquinone site. And if, if this complex is oxidized, it's less likely that it's going to donate an electron to molecular oxygen to make superoxide anion, which is a precursor uh, reactive oxygen species that can go on and make hydroxyl radical, and that damages the membrane and causes membrane lipid peroxidation, DNA damage. So basically, it ketones enhance the production of mitochondrial energy in a way that produces less reactive oxygen species. Most of our reactive oxygen species are coming from the mitochondria. Just like your engine spits out uh, emissions, carbon emissions, if your engine is running more effectively or more efficiently, it's going to produce less emissions. So mitochondria run more efficiently when they're burning ketones as an energy source, and they produce less emissions in the form of reactive oxygen species, which could be potentially damaging to cell membranes, proteins, and your DNA. And then also inflammation. So a big focus of academic scientists and clinicians now are the, the anti-inflammatory effects of the ketogenic diet. And I noticed in myself uh, and many others that follow the ketogenic diet that their C-reactive protein goes down remarkably. And that's uh, really a, probably one of the most important biomarkers of your overall health. Systemic inflammation is, is HSC reactive protein. It's a very important biomarker. And it goes down ubiquitously in everybody who follows a nutritional ketosis regimen. So the bioenergetic effects of ketones on the brain are very interesting and it's, uh, it's a big area of focus in our lab. As I mentioned, the ketones are the site, or the liver is the site of ketone production, unless you're consuming ketones exogenously. And the brain is the primary, the brain and the heart are the two organs that use the most ketones, you know, when they're being produced. Uh, other organs, like your skeletal muscle, can use fat. And remember, the brain can't use fat for energy, so it's using these very small, water-soluble, versions of, of fat breakdown products. So these ketones readily cross the, the uh, blood-brain barrier, they cross the, uh, the cell membrane, and they cross the mitochondria membrane uh, in a way that's much more efficient and rapid than glucose. So there are a number of conditions where you have impaired glucose metabolism resulting in impaired cerebral uh, energy metabolism. So for example, uh, with something like glucose transporter type 1 deficiency syndrome, the blood-brain barrier lacks this glucose transporter. So kids and adults that have the disorder, they need to be in a state of nutritional ketosis or else they're literally like catatonic. They're in it, they can't move. And when they get into a state of nutritional ketosis, they literally wake up and they can start walking around and functioning. So uh, for some of them, the ketogenic diet is very hard for them to follow. So something like a ketone supplement for those who are unable or unwilling to do the ketogenic diet, the supplement could be sort of the magic bullet for them. Um, and the, the glucose transporter three is deficient in those that have Alzheimer's disease. So there's an internalization on the membrane, the glucose transporter is on the membrane of the cell, right? And under conditions of neuropathologies like Parkinson's disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, uh, also with traumatic brain injury, there's less GLUT3 transporters and they also get internalized. So with repeated damage, that glucose transporter gets internalized and there's less glucose flow across the membrane into the mitochondria. 
So another area that's associated with impaired brain energy metabolism is the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, PDH complex. And we know that Alzheimer's disease is also associated with impaired PDH activity. And if you have repeated concussions or traumatic brain injury, that uh, can significantly impair the, the function of this enzyme. So if, if someone has a disorder called, called pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency syndrome, the standard of care for that disorder is the ketogenic diet. So it's another example of uh, the ketogenic diet being effective for, uh, for this enzyme deficiency that's also associated with a broad range of neuropathologies and brain injury. So here's the example of a normal brain. This is glucose energy metabolism. This is a fluorodeoxyglucose PET scan or an FTG PET scan of a normal brain versus someone with Alzheimer's disease. So the idea behind using nutritional ketosis or even ketone supplementation uh, for neurodegenerative diseases is that you can help restore and enhance brain energy metabolism when there's a deficiency, uh, an impairment of normal glucose metabolism. And work by uh, Stephen Kunane, uh, he's a professor that uh, has done a lot of work using a dual PET scan where he shows glucose metabolism in the brain over time as we age goes down whereas ketone metabolism does not decrease. So as we age, our capacity to use glucose as an energy source goes remarkably down, whereas ketone metabolism is unaffected. And that has very significant uh, clinical implications. Uh, and it suggested that, that the older population may actually be more responsive to uh, nutritional ketosis. So there's an intense interest in the scientific community to create the ketogenic diet in a drug, right? Uh, and one way to do that would be to create exogenous ketones. And I got uh, interested in this topic uh, primarily by Dr. Richard Veach. And he was the, the student of Hans Krebs, of the Krebs cycle. We're all familiar with the Krebs cycle. So Dr. Veach really spearheaded the development and the testing of exogenous ketones in the form of a ketone ester. And he was one of the first people that I contacted. I went to his lab at the NIH. I was inspired by his work, but instead of focusing on a single ketogenic agent, I wanted to study all the ketogenic agents and figure out which ones would be more effective for different types of, of applications. So our lab studies many different types of ketones uh, for a broad array of applications. His main application was really looking at warfighter performance, physical performance, and they still have uh, funded programs on that. And another person that really inspired me was Dr. Jung Ro, and uh, he's now at uh, the chair of neurology at the uh, University of Calgary. And he was the first one that told me that nutritional ketosis would be the most effective approach for oxygen toxicity seizures. And he told me that in 2007 or 2008, and that really inspired me to go on this path. Uh, many years later, he's here in a, a uh, conference that I attended, uh, and this is uh, Susan Axelrod. So this is David Axelrod's uh, wife, and who is an uh, informant of the, of the president or President Obama. And sh her, their child has epilepsy. So they hold these conferences, and this one was held at UCB uh, Pharmaceuticals. And it's a pharmaceutical company that recognized that their drug, Keppra, Keppra is probably the most prescribed anti-seizure uh, drug available. They recognized that the ketogenic diet was more effective than their drug, which is really one of the, the standard of care uh, for epilepsy. So they held a conference bringing all the leading scientists here, and I'm over in the corner here, uh, to present on this idea of how can they make the ketogenic diet into a drug. So what specific mechanism is the ketogenic diet working on? Uh, the issue is that the ketogenic diet works through many different mechanisms. It's like that, this slide here. It works through many me different mechanisms in synergy. So it's not just working on uh, 
enhancing GABA production. It's not just working on enhancing uh, anti-inflammatory effects. So it's working on many different mechanisms. So it's going to be pretty hard to develop a drug that can mimic the anti-seizure effects of the ketogenic diet. Uh, but I think drug companies definitely are working on this. And, um, and one of the, another person that kind of connected with me uh, around the time of the conference, so some of the evidence that was presented at the conference was that seizures occur when there's neuroinflammation in the brain. And this neuroinflammation is tied to the gut microbiome, too. And it's tied to uh, kind of, it could be a viral, various things like uh, shingles virus or like the herpes simplex virus. When a virus is activated, and HIV, too, when the virus gets high in our blood, it causes neuroinflammation, it causes a headache, and it causes cognitive impairment. Uh, can even lead to early onset uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. So this inflammatory component uh, is an interest now in the epilepsy world because there's molecules that you can uh, use to look using a PET imaging technology to show that inflammation precedes a seizure. And if you have a seizure, it actually causes in more inflammation and makes you more susceptible to the seizure. So uh, a researcher that reached out to me was uh, Dr. Deep Dixit at Yale University. And his early work showed that fasting, uh, the mechanism of fasting, really had to do with the elevation of beta-hydroxybutyrate. So he did a, a wide array of metabolomic work uh, in subjects that were fasted, and these were animal models. And the one thing that stood out, the big metabolite that stood out, was beta-hydroxybutyrate. So he contacted me, and I formulated a diet that was sent to Yale, and they ran a series of studies uh, to demonstrate that a particular inflammatory complex, the NLRP3 inflammasome, was remarkably suppressed by elevating beta-hydroxybutyrate but keeping the diet normal. So the diet was a standard rodent chow, which is a high-carbohydrate diet, but it had formulated into it uh, a ketone ester, and this ketone ester elevated beta-hydroxybutyrate. And, um, and this was when it was published uh, in this publication here, and I was kind of a middle author because I just designed the diet, but it, it showed that a standard high-carbohydrate diet that could elevate beta-hydroxybutyrate mimic the effects of fasting. So the data on this particular inflammasome complex was equal or comparable to the fasting protocol that he used. So that's just another mechanism that's really completely independent of metabolism. So uh, it was working completely independent of the Krebs cycle metabolites. It's a particular inflammatory pathway. And the, a few publications that came after this, he's worked out all the different signaling uh, effects of this pathway. So now we know that there are different ways to induce therapeutic ketosis. You could use fasting or time-restricted eating. Uh, you could use caloric restriction, uh, the ketogenic diet, obviously. And there's also various drugs that are being studied, like 2-deoxyglucose, lonidamine, 3-bromopyruvate, that inhibit glycolysis and can, from a pharmacological perspective, induce uh, ketogen ketogenesis and fat oxidation. So that's another area of interest. I won't go into the pharmacological agents we're using, but there's also ketogenic fats, like medium-chain triglycerides. When they're consumed, those fats are broken down very rapidly in the liver to produce ketones. And then there's exogenous ketones in the form of ketone salts and also ketone esters, which is a big part of what we're doing. So uh, exogenous ketones circumvent the dietary restriction or fasting that's typically needed uh, to put your body into a state of ketosis. So we know that, uh, and I'm shifting gears here a little bit and going into tumor metabolism. We know that changing our metabolic physiology from being a carbohydrate-fueled system uh, and a sugar-burning system to a fat and ketone-burning system uh, produces a number of remarkable effects 
uh, from a signaling perspective and from a physiological perspective. We found, we've published research showing that if you give an exogenous ketone at high enough dose, it can reduce the level of blood glucose by 50%. So that's remarkably, we do a lot of work with metformin and other hypoglycemic agents, and this far exceeds the glucose lowering effect that we observe with metformin. Uh, the dose has to be very high, uh, and it typically has to be like a ketone ester or very powerful ketogenic agent. But, uh, but we know that tumor metabolism and tumor growth is directly linked to blood glucose. And you can even plot on a chart that tumor growth, as glucose levels increase in animal models, tumor proliferation will increase, tumor growth will increase. So lowering blood glucose is one potential you know, way to decrease cancer growth and proliferation. Also, there's a remarkable reduction in lactate production uh, when you're in the state of nutritional ketosis. Uh, there's reduced proliferation and glycolytic ATP production. So you shift away from glycolysis, which is an energy pathway used primarily by cancer cells. Cancer cells have rates of glycolysis that are up to 200 times higher than normal uh, cells. And being in a state of nutritional ketosis lowers that. So there's also uh, a reduced, with the ketogenic diet, reduced glutamine intake. And glutamine can stimulate uh, cancer growth. And there's reduced proliferation and metastasis. So people typically don't die of a tumor per se, but they die uh, from that tumor releasing cancer cells into the bloodstream and metastasizing to other areas of the body. And that, that triggers organ failure, typically. So being on a ketogenic diet influences a number of pathways to keep the tumor consolidated as it decreases in volume. So it prevents the tumor from releasing, it prevents the metastasis and the invasiveness of the tumor. Uh, my colleague, uh, who is at Barrow Neurological Institute, demonstrated that when you're in a state of nutritional ketosis, it makes your immune system more vigilant to recognize the tumor that you have in your body. So uh, to some extent, ha getting cancer is a failure of the immune system to recognize the tumor and to attack it, right? There's a lot of immune-based therapies that are focused on stimulating the immune system to increase the vigilance of the immune system to attack the tumor. So the ketogenic diet does this. And this has been uh, a series of published studies that recently came out showing that there's a number of factors that are elevated in the blood that increase the tumor-associated immunity. Uh, so my colleague, Thomas Seyfried, has demonstrated with a calorie-restricted ketogenic diet, it's remarkably anti-angiogenic and pro-apoptotic. So what that means, it, it prevents the tumor from forming new blood cells. It also stimulates apoptosis, or programmed cell death, in the tumor. Uh, and more recently, uh, it's been shown that beta-hydroxybutyrate, an endogenous metabolite that we can make, uh, in Eric Verdon's lab, he showed that it has remarkable epigenetic effects. So functioning as a histone deacetylation, uh, an HDAC inhibitor, histone deacetylase inhibitor type 1 and type 2, it activates a genetic program in our body that stimulates uh, endogenous antioxidant pathways. So it makes our bodies and our cells more resilient. And, uh, and if our cells have a greater capacity to buffer reactive oxygen species, that can enhance genomic stability. It protects our DNA. And it protects our DNA from being uh, activated in such a way that oncogenes are activated, cancer-causing genes. So, uh, and also the Nature Medicine paper more recently we've uh, shown that it activates an anti-inflammatory pathway. And that anti-inflammatory, that inflammatory pathway, the NLRP3 inflammasome, is associated with a broad array of autoimmune disorders. It's, uh, the NLRP3 inflammasome is associated with radiation injury, and it's associated with many age-related uh, cognitive impairment disorders. Uh, so we know that beta-hydroxybutyrate suppresses that inflammatory pathway. So it has major implications for longevity 
and, um, and inflammation that occurs with aging. So broadly speaking, as I mentioned, therapeutic ketosis targets either directly or indirectly all the hallmarks of cancer. And this review article here really summarizes the interconnectedness of the tumor metabolism uh, with the hallmarks of cancer. So I guess it dates back, it was only in 2011 did cancer biologists recognize uh, that dysregulated energy metabolism is a hallmark of cancer. Even though Otto Warburg showed this back in the 1920s and 1930s, and we used PET imaging to locate the aggressiveness and the location of tumors, the mainstream cancer biologists were so focused on genetics, they largely ignored that there was energy dysregulation in tumor where there was uh, accelerated hyperactive glycolytic pathways. It was only in 2000, uh, the Hallmarks of Cancer paper came out in 2001, and they revised the paper in 2011 and added dysregulated cellular energetics and also inflammation. And we know from the literature, you could go right to PubMed and look up the different nutritional ketosis articles that show very compellingly that every hallmark of cancer is targeted by nutritional ketosis. Sustained proliferation, suppression of insulin and IGF-1 reduces proliferation, uh, has anti-angiogenic effects, has pro-apoptotic effects, anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, it impacts tumor metabolism to more or less suppress the dysregulation of, of glycolysis that's in tumor cells. So all the hallmarks of cancer are targeted by nutritional ketosis. So getting into the last phase of my talk, I'm gonna talk about implementation of nutritional ketosis. So I would like to define, you know, optimal nutritional ketosis is getting your blood levels of ketones in the one to three millimolar range. So we, we've repeatedly demonstrated, unless you're trying to prevent oxygen toxicity seizures, which may need, you know, four or five millimolar to have maximum anti-seizure effect. For the general population and for overall health, keeping your ketone levels between one and three is, is optimal. And that's totally achievable with a modified ketogenic diet and also using things like MCT oil and ketone supplements that are on the market. So there are a dozen or more different strategies and different diets that you can follow uh, for inducing nutritional ketosis. So I think from the clinical perspective, you have the classical ketogenic diet, which is 90% fat, which is very difficult to follow and uh, can actually lead to uh, a dysregulation of the gut microbiome because of the lack of fiber. Uh, there is, uh, many people get constipation on this diet many people just have, the, the fat levels are so high that many people just can't tolerate it. They get nauseous, they vomit. Uh, so the modified Atkins or the modified ketogenic diet directly below that is the, the type of diet that I actually follow. And now we know, it was published by Eric Kossoff at Johns Hopkins, that the modified ketogenic diet, it actually has almost the same anti-seizure effect as a classical ketogenic diet, especially in adults. So it actually is the first line of therapy in adults. So for years, we're kind of using this you know, draconian form of, of the diet, which is very high in fat, to manage epilepsy in kids, which is very restrictive in protein too. And one of the problems with using the classical ketogenic diet was that it impaired the growth of kids. And that was a major side effect that was probably one of the most severe side effects and it had to do more or less with the restriction in protein to just 3% protein. We now know that if we use 10 to 12 or 15% protein, uh, we can get the same levels of ketones basically and we don't stunt the growth of kids. But more clinicians are actually going towards the modified ketogenic diet, which is more liberal in protein, but still understand that it's less protein than the standard American diet, which is like 30% or more. Uh, the medium chain triglyceride diet uh, focuses on adding more ketogenic fats in the form of MCT oil 
to the diet, so you can almost artificially elevate your ketone levels to that of the classical ketogenic diet and get similar, similar seizure control in people who want to add more carbohydrates to the diet. Uh, and then there's a low glycemic index diet, which is not really a ketogenic diet, but it seems to have anti-seizure effects. So the clinical community really focuses on these ratios of fats to proteins to carbohydrates, and what we're really interested in is focusing on the types of fats and the types of foods, too, that make up these fats and proteins. So that's a whole other area of research, and the carbohydrates uh, are restricted in the ketogenic diet, but it's very important to have a complement of, uh, of different types of fiber to enhance and preserve the, uh, the gut microbiome, the diversity of the gut microbiome. So that's an area that kind of needs its own talk uh, in and of itself, but it's a very important component because the early ketogenic diets, some of the side effects associated with them probably had to do with an impairment of the gut microbiome due to the lack of fiber. So that has been one of the, the big crit, uh, critiques of the ketogenic diet. So one thing that is observed in the epilepsy population is that people who follow the ketogenic diet are deficient in carnitine. So carnitine is a molecule that transports fats to the mitochondria to be burned as energy. And if you're burning more fat, you're going to be potentially depleted in carnitine. So carnitine is a supplement that uh, I would recommend if you're following the ketogenic diet, and also potassium citrate. The early studies showed that in kids that followed the restrictive ketogenic diet, some of them got more kidney stones than others that did not follow the ketogenic diet and were on drug therapy. So uh, it's important that, uh, you know, to pre prevent the potential for kidney stones to have sufficient mineral supplementation Magnesium, potassium, even sodium, all these things will help balance the mild metabolic acidosis that you do have when you're on a nutritional ketosis. If your ketones are elevated, they are mildly acidic, and that acidity can, you know, create some electrolyte imbalances, especially in the beginning, and then your body corrects for it over time. But potassium citrate is a way to help alkalinize the body. Uh, to prevent the potential for that. And, uh, and there's some other supplements that I don't think are necessarily needed that may enhance uh, nutritional ketosis. So one of them is taurine, for example. Taurine helps the liver make more ketones. Uh, we find that taurine can enhance ketone production about 20 or 30 percent, so an animal model. So that's pretty remarkable. And MCT oil is another, it's a fat. You can make salad dressings out of it, incorporate it into foods. And this fat is not packaged into chylomicrons like, uh, like long chain fatty acids. It goes right to the liver uh, through hepatic portal circulation. It's transported rapidly to the liver. And the shorter chain of fat, it's uh, eight and 10 carbons fat, they, are, they rapidly make ketones in the liver. So we call them ketogenic fats. So MCT oil is a very uh, useful supplement for a ketogenic diet. And then there's ketone supplementation. So there's a variety of ketogenic products on the market now um, that are available. I, don't, I won't promote any particular product, uh, but I recommend testing your blood levels for the ketones to determine whether that product is, uh, is a viable product. So one thing that's good about ketone supplements that are on the market, there's commercially available tools that allow you to test your blood to determine if that supplement is, has the potency and the purity that you're looking for. So you can actually test for it. So in addition to different versions of the ketogenic diet and also exogenous ketones, there's time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting. And, uh, and one thing that I do personally is that I will do 16 hours of fasting and eight hours of eating. And within that eight hour of eating window, I'll eat low carb or ketogenic. So I can maintain the level of ketosis uh, during my eating period. So, and I do that a couple times a week. I don't do it every day, but I think time restricted eating is something that's fairly easy to implement and can actually enhance it's a way to enhance your body's own 
uh, ability to make ketones. And when you're in a state of ketosis, when you're fasting, you typically don't get hungry. So that's one of the benefits of it. So there's a lot of commercially available tools for assessing nutritional ketosis. There's urine, there's breath, there's a variety of blood meters. And soon on the market, I think you'll find future devices like the Dexcom, which continually measures your blood glucose levels. There's going to be technologies emerging on the market that will allow you to continuously measure blood glucose, blood ketones, and even blood lactate. So some of these companies have contacted me. They're, they have prototype devices that are coming out. So you can have, think about it as like real-time metabolomics, right? Where it can report to, you're measuring from uh, a needle or even a patch that's on your skin, and it's measuring the blood levels of these metabolites, and it's being reported to your smartphone. So you can look at your smartphone and see your levels of ketones, lactate, and other metabolites, and consume a supplement to optimize your level almost in real time throughout the day. So these are things that the military is working on, but eventually they're going to find their way into mainstream uh, you know, public or in, into medicine. And I think they're really going to optimize uh, the health and actually the management of many diseases that can be managed with a ketogenic diet and also for physical performance, for weight, ma weight management, and for, uh, yeah, the military is really interested in it for optimizing their cognitive and physical performance. So, so one of the things I think is a very powerful tool therapeutically is something called the glucose ketone index. And I mentioned it briefly in the beginning of my talk. So that's the ratio of glucose over ketones in millimolar, right? So, uh, so as an example, Dr. Tom Seyfried uh, worked on this and published a paper. This particular paper here has, uh, it's, it's open access. So if you just Google the name of this paper, it'll take you to the actual article and you can download it for free. And it actually lists all the different cancer studies that compellingly demonstrate that if you maintain a glucose ketone index between about one and four, that that's very therapeutic. We know that's therapeutic for a broad range of seizure disorders. It's also highly effective for managing many types of cancer. So, um, and there's different approaches that you can do to get to that therapeutic range. So if you just follow a low carb diet that's not ketogenic, and this, th these are my glucose ketone indexes. So I have a glucose ketone index here of 6.6, .6, which is kind of outside the therapeutic range. My glucose here is 4.6 and my ketones are uh, 0 0.7. If I do a very strict ketogenic diet with like 90% fat, 85 to 90% fat, I can get my glucose ketone index to one. So one is probably, you know, the highest level of ketones that I can get uh, unless I use different, unless I use supplementation. So basically my glucose level is at the same level as my ketones. So that gives you a glucose ketone index of one. Uh, <clears throat> When I was on the NASA NEMO uh, 22 mission, I experimented with a modified ketogenic diet. I did the modified ketogenic diet, time-restricted eating. I ate within about a four to six hour window, and I took ketone supplements on top of that. <laughs> so you could potentially have a patient and do this and really get, this is probably one of the lowest glucose ketone index ratios that I got. My glucose was 2.3 and my ketones were uh, 6.9. And uh, so I think that could be potentially very therapeutic for someone who has, you know, in theory, I would not tell people to do this, but if you had traumatic brain injury, if you had a seizure disorder, if you had advanced metastatic cancer, we know that if you decrease glucose to this level, that's going to put tremendous metabolic stress on cancer. So cancer need lots of, of glucose to survive and grow. And if the glucose is limited, it triggers cell death in cancer. So I think, you know, the articles show that a therapeutic window 
uh, is between one and four, but you may have a super therapeutic window if you get a little lower than that. And I think that could be achieved, especially with a combination of intermittent fasting and ketone supplementation. And the diet doesn't even have to be that strict. I think the diet could be more of a modified ketogenic diet that's more liberal in carbohydrates. Instead of 3% carbohydrates or 5%, you can get 5 or 10% of your diet in the form of carbohydrates, in the form of fibrous vegetables. So salads, especially raw vegetables, have a very low glycemic index. Two or three salads a day, sauteed vegetables, green vegetables, especially in butter, uh, have a minimal impact on uh, glucose levels and uh, can actually elevate ketones from the fiber. So there's a number of biomarkers that I like to test for when being in a state of, of ketosis to kind of validate its therapeutic effects. <clears throat> Uh, many people ask me about cortisol level getting really high when you start a ketogenic diet. And that happened with me, but now my cortisol level is actually mild or low. And this is my latest cortisol level numbers, and you can see my levels are actually pretty low. And it was, it was a week into a vacation, so I didn't have my normal stress. But when I'm at my job, my cortisol level is a little bit elevated, but if I take a week vacation, a couple days off and I'm very relaxed uh, and I'm on a strict ketogenic diet, my cortisol levels stay relatively low. Uh, and also below that, you'll see my insulin levels are uh, typically they stay, you know, anywhere between two and three, which is on the low end of normal. This particular insulin, uh, this test was supposed to be done in a fasted state. I consumed a ketone ester or a ketone supplement that put my levels at starvation level ketosis. And the, a ketone supplement can cause a small increase in insulin, but it's still, my insulin levels still maintain very low, even with taking ketone supplements. Uh, what was remarkably, you know, reduced is that my HSC reactive protein st used to be about two or three, some, sometimes up to five. It's always 0.1. And then in this case, it was actually below 0.1. So that has been one of the most remarkable things that has happened to me in a state of nutritional ketosis, that it dramatically reduced my inflammation markers. And I think uh, that has very <coughs> significant uh, you know, therapeutic effects in, in many patients. And my hemoglobin H1C typically stays around you know, 4 uh, you know, 3.9 or 4.5, somewhere around there. So this is just uh, examples, this is just my example. So coming to the end of my talk now, when we talk about future directions for cancer therapy, uh, we have a publication out talking about the, uh, the press pulse protocol. So this involves using the ketogenic diet and uh, to lower blood glucose, elevate ketones and suppress insulin. So suppressing insulin is really important for the management of cancer because many growth factors are driven by insulin. Uh, the use of metformin can be continuous. Uh, things like strength training, you know, pre and probiotics are very good, meditation, exercise. All these things help you achieve that glucose ketone index of one you know, closer to one is being optimal, especially for cancer management. When you achieve a glucose ketone index with, within the range of one to four, then other modalities can be pulsed. And that can include radiation therapy and chemotherapy, but I would choose those as like a last resort and use uh, potentially other therapies like hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So hyperbaric oxygen therapy elevates free radical levels in cancer, and when you're in a state of nutritional ketosis, it weakens the cancer's antioxidant defenses. So uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy also reverses tumor hypoxia. If the tumor is hypoxic, that can stimulate angiogenesis and other things that make the tumor grow. So hyperbaric oxygen reverses tumor hypoxia, hyperoxygenates the tumor, and the tumor is used to surviving in a low oxygen environment. So when it sees high levels of oxygen, it overproduces free radicals, and that can kill the tumor from the inside out. 
Radiation therapy does that too, but it does it in a way that creates a lot of collateral damage. So hyperbaric oxygen, I think of as a more gentle approach to killing cancer uh, through oxidative stress, but much more gentle than radiation therapy. So intravenous vitamin C is another therapy that we're studying in the lab, and we find that high levels of vitamin C can increase oxidative stress in tumor cells. So it, it fuels something called the Fenton reaction. So uh, vitamin C is an antioxidant, but if it's used in pharmacological doses achieved with IV therapy, it can actually be a pro-oxidant, and it can be a pro-oxidant that sensitizes the tumor cells to uh, other, other modalities and helps to kill them. And, and there's a, a toolbox of drugs that can be used, including 2-deoxyglucose, loninamine, DCA, and these are potentially uh, toxic, but they can be pulsed in a way that's three weeks on or two weeks off. Uh, you know, you can do an on and off schedule and cycle these therapies so they're not toxic. So the idea is that the, with a press pulse therapy is that you apply a press to the cancer and impair, you, you stress the cancer with a press therapy and then you pulse more toxic, potentially toxic therapies, but you do it in a cyclic approach. So this would be, uh, you know, we envision uh, a therapy where we can completely eliminate radiation and chemo. From this and we think that from an animal model perspective we can get better results with non-toxic therapies than we can with toxic therapies and that's sort of the general idea here so here's an overall summary of things that we're working on past current and future with nutritional ketosis oxygen toxicity Alzheimer's disease I didn't talk about it but Angelman syndrome is kind of similar it's it's a defect in a gene that uh, the symptomatic result is, is seizures and also an impairment of motor function. And kids with Angelman syndrome respond remarkably well to the ketogenic diet. And they respond better to the ketogenic diet than any known drug. So the first clinical trial that we're going to do uh, with exogenous ketones is actually for Angelman syndrome. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't choose to talk about it because it's kind of a rare, a rare disease, but uh, I'm very inspired that this will set a precedent that using it for this, uh, you know, compassionate use, that it's hard to get clinical approval to use ketone, ketone esters. But for something like Angelman syndrome that has no known therapies, uh, it's more easy to get it passed an ethics committee. So we're working on, on doing that. Uh, my wife has done a series of studies showing that exogenous ketones have remarkable uh, anti-anxiety effects. And I think that has tremendous implications. Our society uh, overuses many different medications that are you know, used to reduce anxiety. And the fact that we, our bodies can make endogenous metabolites that have anti-anxiety effects, I think that's a really interesting and exciting area of, of research that we're going into right now. Um, and you can list, I mean, you can see the list of things that uh, goes way beyond pediatric epilepsy. So we've been very inspired by the therapeutic effects of nutritional ketosis. And we think that this list could potentially, you know, double or triple in the years to come. There's just so many different applications for nutritional ketosis. And I think as physicians and medical doctors, I think it's important to recognize, especially in cases where there are no known therapies out there that nutritional ketosis could be a viable approach. So I'd like to thank you for listening today. Thank you for your attention, for your interest in this topic. Uh, I'd like to thank my beautiful wife who uh, deals with <laughs> all the time I spend in the lab and, and travel on the road. She's really in the trenches doing the actual research. I'm here presenting to you today, but my wife has done a lot of the research you know, that's uh, being done right now. And she has her own lab, uh, but we collaborate on a wide variety of projects. And here's our team at University of South Florida. Uh, we have postdocs, research associates, medical students, uh, many enthusiastic medical students. 
I teach medicine, I teach to the medical students, but you know, the medical curriculum does not yet have nutrition into the program. Uh, so I think it's very important, medical students want this information, and I think it's very important for them uh, to have access to this information. So I'm trying to change the medical curriculum to allow uh, for classes to be taught on nutritional ketosis as a means to manage things like type 2 diabetes, uh, things that the physicians will see when they get into practice. So I have a list, maybe uh, my slides can be made available to all you. Many of the things that I talked about uh, are covered in the references here. And uh, I always direct people, people always ask me, where can I go for more information? Uh, my website, Keto Nutrition, Dot org has you know pretty much information on all the things I talked about today whether it's a publication a podcast there's a list of doctors on there there's a list of clinical trials there's a list of consultants on there there's also a list of, of ketogenic foods that are approved by me and also ketone supplements that we've actually tested and validated in the lab are on the, the keto nutrition website so thanks again for your attention. I think I might have went a little bit over, but I'm here to answer any questions that you may have.